This is Dave Schumann here for the Success for Life podcast. Welcome back. Uh, I believe this is episode 39 will be going on here. Um, I have a very special guest. He's not someone that you'll see a ton of interviews in, so make sure you soak up in this space, in the success and entrepreneur space, uh, everything that he has to talk about today. I'm with Neil Stratton, the CEO of Inside the League, one of the foremost um, and, and insider inputs with respect to the NFL. If you're looking to find out everything from what goes on behind closed doors with agents and what goes on from training facilities to the NFL draft to all of those things in, in far and in between, um, Neil's built an amazing business, amazing niche, um, and he is uh, the guru in this space. Um, so I'm very happy to have on Neil Stratton. Neil. Dave, it's an honor. I hope that I can match that to introduction, man. I'll do the best I can. <laughs> um, t tell everybody a little bit about y your background and kind of how you got into it and what obviously Inside the League is about. Well, as a player, I was nothing special. I mean, I always say that it's possible that the year that I played, I played at Navy um, when it was when football was very different for Navy. They were always telling us we need to go down to F FCS. Um, this was in the late 90s. And I would say I was probably the worst player on the worst team in America. So, I mean, I've got that going for me. Um, so as a player, I was nothing fancy. But um, fast forward about uh, 20 years, and I had just moved to Houston, Texas in uh, the late 90s and didn't know anybody. And the first person I met wanted to be the next Mel Kuyper Jr., um, a friend of mine named Troy. And so for four years, we... I took the defense and he took the offense and we did kind of an off uh, kind of a draft based website. We were kind of the first draft gurus along, you know, along with Mel Kiber, but on a, obviously a much smaller scale. Uh, the problem was we were doing a print product when the web was kind of going like this. So for four years, we took turns losing about $2,000 publishing something that we would stack up in our garage. And um, after a time, Troy decided, hey, it's probably time to move on. And I was just dumb enough to where I had gone to enough all-star games and started to meet agents that I realized there was no news service for the industry. Um, not for fans, but for people like trainers and agents and scouts and those kinds of things. So we launched in 02. Um, originally our laser focus was on agents. Uh, we've expanded that since, but that's kind of where we started. And in the early 2000s, that's when the idea of sports business news was something people could grasp. I mean, in the old days, Sports was just scores and highlights. But as the game became much more monetized and bigger and, and the scale expanded, then sports businesses became, a, uh, I guess, something that people could grasp. And so our, I, our idea was to go to sports business news every day and football specifically. And we were going to put it on the web, on this World Wide Web crazy thing that they had now. And so we launched in 02. And, um, I don't know how many details you want, but for the first six or seven years, we kind of toddled along, didn't do so well. Um, in 08, I'm sorry, I was hired in 2007 to run the Hula Bowl, which at the time was the number three all-star game. And I shuttered inside the league and I was happy to do it. It had been a struggle and I hadn't gotten there. And I thought, well, hey, in 20 years, I'll, I'll retire and wear a grass skirt every day and I'll live in Honolulu and I'll drink out of coconuts or something. And uh, that didn't work out. I came home in January, the game folded. And uh, I came home in January of 08, and my wife said, listen, you need to do this thing that you said you were gonna do, which is make it strictly for people in the industry and charge for that. I had kind of run away from my earlier mission, and I kind of kept one foot on the fan side, and I tried to make it very affordable. So we went from a $45 for a nine-month cycle price point to 25 bucks per month, every month price point. And it scared me to death because I had no idea what I was gonna write in you know, June, July, and August. But uh, here we are, um, I guess, 16 years later, and we've been really fortunate to develop a lot of relationships like ours with yours, with yourself, and have worked across the industry, and we try to work wherever there are plug, uh, points that we can plug into. We are a niche service, and you alluded to that, but we have tried to fill that niche as much as we possibly can. And so now we work not only with agents, but with scouts, trainers, financial uh, professionals, wealth managers, uh, a lot of parents of players, the players themselves, anywhere where there's a need, our credo is succeed in football. And so we'll do anything we can to help anyone succeed in football, just like you try to help with success in life. 
So it, it, I think it's really interesting because, um, it, and you probably get inundated with this, so many people want to be involved in football and, and so many people don't, you know, they either think they know what to do, they don't know what to do. Um, they think it's easy to jump in. I'm sure you've seen that before, right? The, I want to be in football. Oh, and, and they don't realize, first of all, how tight, tight, small the circle is. Um, but also because of that, how hard it is to, to penetrate and have real success in that industry. Um, someone who, who's coming in, in, into football and in the prof especially what we're, what we're talking about, which is the professional ranks. Um, you know, what are some of the things that you would advise them to really think about before they get into this space? It's interesting that you say that. I was, I was just, while you're talking, I was thinking about a panel that I sat on probably 10 years ago uh, at a small school in Michigan. And on the panel was me and a member of the NCAA enforcement division and a pretty established agent, three people. All of us had started off not working in the capacity that we were working. We had all started off as entrepreneurs. The agent had started off in his own, you know, and kind of done something related to the agent business before he actually went on his own. The NCAA guy had done something football related that he just started from scratch. I think it was kind of a high school sports kind of thing. And then there's me who did my kind of thing. And I think the, the one lesson that I've learned, Dave, is you can't, get succeed in this space with something out of a box. You can't go and think I'm gonna sit in this class and pay this amount and get this piece of paper and bam, now I am a successful agent or even I'm not even necessarily on the path to becoming a scout or an agent or anything else. You've gotta go out and you've gotta find, you've gotta survey the market, you've gotta learn and do your research and you gotta find a niche and then you gotta serve that niche. There are still people that succeed by just going to the NFL PA and passing the test and then doing things in a traditional fashion. There's still people that go out and get sport management degrees and they wind up getting a scouting position somewhere. That's exciting. There are people that do all kinds of things in a traditional way, but your chances of doing that are so much slimmer than if you go out and take a chance, try to find something that no one else is doing, preferably, work really hard at it, can be consumed by it, be patient, stay on track, and follow it and you know whatever we've achieved in this in this game and i'm certain i'm saying I'm, not, I'm a big deal but we're still around going on 20 years later i think because i did that and i didn't try to do whatever the traditional path was whatever that was yeah and i think that's one thing that i found um most successful entrepreneurs in their space really do is they could they carve their own path they learn from things that they've seen and, and carve the path where they think they, they might fit best um, something that obviously that they're interested in, you know, I, I always say like pa passion is important, but, um, at, at some point, no matter what your passion is, that work's going to be work. Right. So, um, you have to have the diligence to be able to, to continue to strive when things go down, when bank accounts go up and down. And I've seen it myself. I'm sure you have yourself. You're like, we're doing great. And then literally six months later, you're like, oh man, are we going out of business? You know? So it, it's it's a very very difficult road always for entrepreneurs and and um, every interviewer conversation I see even guys that are really wealthy still worry about those things from from that standpoint as entrepreneurs and guys that have attained the highest amount of wealth still worry about that every day. I, I think what's really interesting is you not only did you carve out a niche, but you figured out how to serve parties. Um, that first of all, a lot of people didn't want to serve, right? Like most people don't want to work with agents and, and obviously I'm an agent and uh, a lot of people don't want to work with agents. A lot of people don't want to work with scouts. Scouts don't want to work with agents, right? So, um, and, and all those parties have to get along and you, and you figured out how to kind of be that go between in a lot of ways, providing information for both parties, uh, helping parties connect to, to serve uh, each other better, including the tr training facilities, which, you know, uh, we've talked about this, um, you know, offline in the past, how uh, that that industry has, you know, continued to boom. And then there's always things that are different going on and, and even in that industry as well. But you've connected all those different areas through your website. And then 
what I found that you do is really well. Like when I'm at the NFL Combine, you, your ability to connect with so many people individually um, on a mass level, but make it individual. I, I, I like if I were to say that's your unique trait, you know, getting to know you. I think it's amazing. Like you could spend, you know, you might be real busy with, you know, doing things, but you could spend one minute with somebody, shake their hand, talk to them, um, you know, say, hey, we, we can get together later. And that person not walk away feels slighted. I think it's a unique skill set. Talk a little bit about how, you know, is that something you always had? Did you develop that? Um, you know, I think that's something that a skill set that a lot of people need to learn. And that is so important, David. And I mean, I, there's two sides of that. When I go to uh, a restaurant or a convenience store or whatever, and my kids are with me and I get poor service, I always point it out to them. And I say, listen, I'm not always gonna get a uh, good service from people, but you better be providing it if you wanna succeed. And I don't care what you do. Um, I don't know that I was always laser focused on that. I don't know if that's something that was always important to me. But man, it is now. And if you want to try to fill a niche or you want to try to be an entrepreneur, you better make your customers your friends. My wife always used to kid me and say, I don't have any friends. And I always laugh and say, hey, my, my clients are my friends. Those are the people that I, they understand me. And I understand them. We're both weird. You know, we have that in common. Um, when I go, you, you've been to my seminars at the Combine every year. And uh, the last thing I always say, or the first thing I always say, really, when I go up and kind of introduce the guests and what have you is, I appreciate everyone in this room and y'all help me live the life that I want to live and live my dream and support my family. And that is, David, it's critical. I mean, what's more important than that? Um, so yeah, I do. I mean, that's one of the things I value the most about the combine. It's crazy. It is wild. And sometimes people, and I say this in all modesty, I'll be walking down the hall and everyone's, hey, Neil. I try to go over and greet them at least and try to greet them by name. It's so important that they know that I value them. I mean, I don't take that for granted. And, and I hope that if I ever get really big, that I never stop take, I mean, that I never take people for granted. I mean, that is critical. And I know you're the same way, Dave. I mean, it's not always easy when you live in a cell phone and email existence professionally to remember someone's name and certainly not to remember their face, but you gotta do the best you can. You got you got to make them understand that they are valuable to you um even if you don't see them once a year i i think so anyway i think that's the key to any anyone's success uh, absolutely there's no doubt about it it's a skill set and you know i i talk a lot about education now, you went to navy obviously as 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 good an education as you can get in the united states um then did you have to then serve as well or well I was not only not talented on the football field, I wasn't very talented in the classroom either, Dave. Uh, I wound up finishing up at a school called Marshall, Marshall University. Okay. Everyone yeah. else saw the and what have you. Um, so, uh, no, I didn't have to go to the Navy. I was one of the rare guys that left, and they basically said, good riddance, get out of here, we never want to see you again. Um, I, uh, which I was happy about. I, I think I set a record. They used to have something called an academic board, which you went to at the end of the semester if your grades were really failing. I think I set a record for academic boards. I was going in the summer, they were inventing academic boards for me, all right? So um, I guess one good point that you can make from this, again, any success I've achieved had nothing to do with intelligence. It was strictly on uh, guts and persistence and whatever else you can mix in there, but it wasn't smart. And I think those attributes, and that's kind of what I, 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 I'm getting at, which I find is really interesting. You know, I, I played football at UConn. I ended up getting my MBA there. I, I I went down that traditional path. Um, I did really well in it when I went into business, and um, but there was something in sports that was tugging at me. <clears throat> and for me, initially, it was in, I was training athletes, and then I had a training facility. Then I started running high school combines. It just kind of continued to evolve. And um, but I can tell you this honestly that as I, there were things I learned in college, and there were some things educationally that. Um, there were some professors that were fantastic that learned some things from, but I thought um, the education that I got in order to be an entrepreneur, they could they they couldn't do they couldn't replicate it in college, and um, and I was in the MBA program where they try to replicate it as well. So after I got out of undergrad, I went right through, right through because I was still playing, um, got my MBA. And you, and, and you couldn't replicate it other than, than doing it yourself. And um, 
I, I think education is obviously incredibly important. It's very valuable. I would never under, underscore that. But I think that people have to go and get their own education as to from learning. And today, I mean, my God, with YouTube alone, right, or or podcast, anything like this, you can start to do that. How, how important? And and you talked about your non-traditional path with, within football. How important is it for somebody? So they want to be an agent or they want to be a scout. They want to be a trainer. How important is it for them to find somebody that they can connect with, that they can learn real world skills from? Um, mm -hmm. and, and, and is there somebody that, you know, that you did that or you really kind of had to go do it on your own? Well, it's funny you should mention that. I mean, I'm in San Angelo, uh, Texas right now. It's in West Texas. It's I'm at a, a football clinic. I've been coming here off and on for, well, since 02. I, the first time I came was in 02, the year I launched ITL. And that summer, I just came cold. And I met a guy here named John Paul Young. And John Paul has been in football for, well, you know, 50 years probably. He was on staff with several NFL teams as well as several college teams. The funny thing is he's kind of become like a second father to me, other than my own father and my father-in-law, there's no one I respect more than John Paul. And I came to San Angelo. It's a long drive from Katy, Texas. Um, I got here knowing no one. I came in, I you know, stayed in a hotel room somewhere here in San Angelo. I just went up to him the last day, I was getting ready to leave and it had been my goal to meet him. And so literally, I'm, my, I mean, my car's out in the lot, I'm getting ready to walk out and I walk over, he's in the middle of a group and I said, I just wanted to say hi. I'm with you. At the time, I was with the Houston Chronicle. I just wanted to meet you. Um, and I gave him a business card. And he kind of brushed me off because uh, he was right in the middle of a conversation. I got about halfway home, and he just calls me and says, hey, man, I didn't get to talk to you. And for probably an hour and a half of that trip, he told me everything about how the clinic had run and who they'd had there and all these kind of things. And that was the beginning of a relationship that's going on 20 years now. And John Paul worked for me initially. Um, he's been a mentor. We've worked on several projects along the way. That's a guy that I didn't have when I started this. ITL was already going to happen before I met him. I mean, finding that mentor isn't always someone that is right in front of you. Um, it's, it's a little bit like jumping out of a, a plane and you're not sure your parachute works. You're going to kind of take it you know, 100 feet at a time or whatever. Um, you got to keep working and learning and meeting those people. And there's so many people I've met along the way. Dave, I mean, I'm not trying to butter you up, but watching your success and you know, every time we talk, we on the phone, we start off talking about football, we wind up talking about business for 90% of the phone call. Um, <laughs> those are just things you gather along the way if you're fortunate. I mean, uh, the most important thing that I have, the most important thing I have professionally, there are the phone numbers in my phone. Um, they all represent relationships and people that I've met along the way. And, people that I hope think well of me, I definitely think well of them. And, um, but you don't have that until you wade into it. I mean, and you can't get that with a degree. And I don't mean to, uh, you know, I'm not dumping on education either. It is very important. It's a foundation for you, but it's just the start. And I think a lot of people come in thinking, well, I got a degree, what else you want me to do? <laughs> a lot, there's a whole lot for you to do. If you're passionate and if you want to do something kind of cool, you're gonna have to work. There's a price to be paid. I mean, you know that as well as I do. Yeah, and I, I think that's one of the things even I had to learn because I've been an entrepreneur and I, I think was humbling um, it, when I started to work in the NFL with, with, as an agent is, you know, every everything that I had done entrepreneur-wise, I conceptualized an idea and kind of blew it out I uh, had some pretty good success. Uh, I, I wouldn't say immediately, but uh, within within you know a, a two year period, was able to grow things pretty quickly, um, and uh, and that's because I've always uh, I'll try multiple things until I see something that works and, and that I like, and I'll go with it. But um, but I found the agent business to be a different kind of challenge, and the thing that I learned, and I think it was something I needed to learn, um, was that. You, you know, the NFL will hit you right in the face with basically, you must build relationships. You must make, even if you have, because I had a lot of relationships going in, you must then cultivate those relationships, even if you have them. And people, again, they may trust you in one space, but they've got to also now trust you in this other space as well. 
um, and you got to prove it. And uh, and obviously we're we're you know even though we're four years in, we're we're still you know babies. I would say in in that that industry uh, compared to guys that have been around for for much longer. But but I've learned that and learned uh, I've begun to learn that and learned the, that how important that is. Um, how important do you feel the patience is with someone that's looking to get, I mean, it could apply to any space, um, but you know, it, it, it particularly anything to do with football, how important is patience? And explain to people how much value, because I could say it's one thing, but someone who's really d done it as, as well as you have for a long time, how important and how much do people value the ability to be there for a period of time and proving it each and every year? How much do they value that in, in football? Well, you know, football is like anything else. I mean, something that I always remind myself is that, uh, you know, like Bill Parcells said, you are what your record says you are. Um, you, you talked about patience and patience is important, um, but proving it and doing it and having success is important as well. I would call it measured patience. I remember um, lying in bed with my wife, I mean, in 2000, and we had just gotten married uh, that summer and thinking, and at the time we were in the waning days of Lone Star, which was kind of the predecessor of Inside the League and it wasn't happening. And I remember thinking, are we gonna be eating dog food when we retire? I mean, is this the way it's gonna be? I, I knew that something had to change. And um, so I went and did Inside the League and we had a five, six year run there where it still wasn't really happening. Um, so I was still staying on the path, but it wasn't doing what I wanted to. When I came back and my wife essentially took me by the shoulders and said, hey, knucklehead, why don't you do what you said you were gonna do? Is it when we really started to take off? So I think patience is important and continuing to do it, um, but also be honest with yourself about what's working and what's not working. You talked about the fact that when you start off, you're a trainer. Um, being a trainer is value. You learned a lot of things, but it wasn't until really things took out, took things didn't really take off until you started with a combine, started increasing your scale, all those kinds of things. Um, so yeah, you do have to have patience. You have to stay on goal and stay on task. Um, but you have, but to win relationships and continue those relationships, you kind of got to prove it every day, and you got to make sure that you're still there and that you're effective, and that others see you expanding those relationships. And I hate to say this. There's a quid pro quo to relationships. If you're not bringing someone the what they need, then they may tend to gravitate away from that relationship. I don't mean that, that to sound like people are, uh, you know, uh, frivolous about that. But the fact is, we can be they, we we might be friends if I stopped football, but I wouldn't. We wouldn't be the same kind of friends because I couldn't try. I couldn't bring you the same value. Um, so you got to be mindful of that at all times and understand that and understand that your worth is, is derived from what you can bring people. When you stop bringing people worth, then it does change the relationship. Those are the facts of life. I, I think that that's an incredible point. Um, and I think a lot of people get that messed up. Like, you know, I, I, people will see in business, you know, they're like, oh, this guy doesn't spend that much time with me, you know. He he's he's a jerk or something like that. And and what people have to realize is exactly what you talked about: building value for another person. Um, and you develop friendships from that. But building value with another person is critical. Continue to figure out how you can create value for the other individual. Obviously, helps you create value for yourself. Um, and I think so many people in business miss it. Like I, I, no, I say this all the time. Like you, you can hit something right. Like, um, there, there are some agents that had first rounders in the first couple of years and then they can't get any first rounders anymore. Right. So there's a little luck component to, to fall in the right place. But in order to be wildly successful, like, you, you know, some of the big time agents that are out there, it's being able to have good success every single year and stacking on, on, on top of that and be able to create value for other people every single year. Um, but I think that's important because people get feelings, their own feelings so involved um, with an, an interaction that could take place for one minute. 
and instead of looking at the picture of what's going on, the big picture as to what might be going on in that snapshot of time, in that particular moment, I, I can't tell you, it's running my events, you know, when you run uh, camps and stuff like I have for so many years, um, especially when we we're really, in a, we had this huge growth phase from 2011 to 2013, huge growth phase. We were a 5,000 company at that time. Um, before things started to plateau in that industry for us. And we were growing so fast and I was just, you know, I'm just like you and I, I try to, any person that comes up to me, I try to make sure I connect even if it's for 30 seconds. But as we were growing so fast and we were going from city to city, um, I was struggling with that because people who I used to know by name and face now is becoming scale was much harder. Mm-hmm. And I would get some emails and it was, uh, where people, um, you know, I used to take them very much to heart where they would say, you know, I, I introduced myself, you didn't know who my son was or something along those lines, right? And it, it took me probably a couple of years to realize that um, those people are allowing their personal feelings at that moment to get into the way of the big picture of their son going on to college. Because what would happen so many times is I'll get these emails or somebody being upset with something. And, and you know, the majority of people are very happy, but those ones, you, that's what you read, right? The people that complain. And um, three or four years later, when their son's in college, I'll I'll get an email like, wow, you know, we, we didn't realize that, um, you know, you guys were sending things out all the whole time. Like I always tell people, the event is like the face, but, that is not even important compared to what we do behind the scenes and people have a hard time realizing that so I would say like you got to think about you know um, the long run of how this is gonna work out for you and and don't get your your personal feelings involved in, in an exact situation like coach uh, the same thing I always tell kids the same thing like there's gonna be times when you're gonna be upset with me parents I said there might be times when you're upset with me but when your son is going to college for free or your son's going to a school he probably wouldn't have gotten into um you're gonna you're gonna not think about those those things and you're gonna realize that it was all part of the bigger picture and that's and and that's my job so i think that point on value is so important and people miss that you know uh you know what what do you think about that there's a well you know i know that it is a struggle to juggle those things and to make people feel important you want to do that at all times i will say this I see this, my, both my sons play AAU basketball, um, but not every player they play shoot them. My sons themselves are not superstars, but there's, I guess for lack of a better term, a showbiz aspect to big time athletics. And anytime you have that, there's gonna be a certain level of status and a certain level of ego that's a part of that. And of course there's pride in your son and in his performance and you take, you know, that becomes part of your own self. And so it is hard to do that. That's true <laughs> times 10 million on the NFL uh, level, um, on the co- big time college level. And so, yes, it is not easy. And um, and God knows, Dave, there are people that have felt slighted by me. And I feel, I really honestly feel terrible yeah. about that. Um, you do the best you can, but you also have to realize that sometimes the best you can is not good enough. and you keep on moving and hopefully you do better next time. I, I think you covered some really important things uh, um, from a business standpoint. I want to touch now a little bit about uh, exactly, you know, right in the, your world of what they what, what they do. Start with agents. Um, what have you found that the best agents done and what would you stay away from if someone was looking to get and I'm going to kind of touch, I'm going to go through kind of your three main areas, which I, I, I if, you know, if I'm wrong, you can tell me, but agents, scouts, and then trainers, I guess would probably be, even though the trainers, you're, you're more on the peripheral, but I'm sure you deal with them as well, um, uh, you know, with, within your site. So from an agent standpoint, what, what have you found that the really best guys have done really well? And what have you found uh, things they should stay away from? Well, I think there are a couple of things that can trip you up. Um, there's been such a proliferation of sport management programs across the country in the last 10 years. Uh, there are a lot of people that are going and they're getting instruction in school and they, a lot of them you know, walk out with a four-year degree. They got a 
maybe a B average and they think that they're going to be the next Brian Cashman or the next, uh, you know, whatever, the next GM of a major uh, franchise. There's so much more to it than that. And I think on an agent level, uh, you get drilled in maybe from seeing Jerry Maguire, Maguire one too many times, maybe from listening to the guy at your ivory tower school who tells you he knows everything about sports is that the number one uh, skill for you as an agent is negotiation. Um, David, as you know, the way the CBA is set up now for the rookie deal, it's a pretty paint by numbers proposition. It's not, not to say there is no negotiation, but that's about 1% of what you do. 99% of what you do is recruiting and meeting people that can help you and building those relationships. Um, any number of things that are more human based skills rather than educational academic kind of things. If you are not recruiting, and you're just waiting for someone to call you, and I don't care if you're an agent or a trainer or a financial manager, a plan, planner or anyone in the business, you're in deep trouble. So you gotta stay away from that. You've gotta develop those human skills and you gotta be unafraid to have someone hang up the phone on you, slam the door on you, tell you you suck. All those things have happened to me just in this morning. I'm just kidding. But I mean, there are things that happen all the time and you have to accept that. That's just the way it is. Um, as far as, uh, I think that the mistake that a lot of scouts, aspiring scouts make, um, and we've kind of covered this is, um, they get out and they may apply to jobs and they may do things like that. Um, you've got, again, you've got to go out there and make contacts. I always say, Dave, and I know you've done this as well, you've got to work for free at some point. And a lot of people feel like, well, you know, I'm not going to work unless I get paid. Bro, you don't have any value right now until you, you will know you have value when you have lots of people calling you and, you know, not asking, but demanding that you come and help them or whatever. That's when you can charge. For the first portion of your job, I mean, when you're starting out, man, you got to be willing to volunteer and sweat and bleed a little bit and do whatever you got to do to pay to do, pay dues to build those relationships that might lead you to a scouting job or something else. Um, I think on the financial manager side, the, the one biggest mistake they make and again it's relationship related is hey I got certified by the NFLPA I've got all the, these phone numbers of agents um, and emails and all that kind of stuff I'm just going to call them and say hey I've got all this money under management why don't you let me manage your players um, again <laughs> man they're getting bombarded by people like that you've right. got to go and prove to them who you are and show them who you are you've got to go directly to the player you got to go directly to their parents Again, prove yourself, show the value that you can provide, show that you don't have a big eye in the middle of your forehead and horns growing out. Um, you've got to show that you're a human being and that you can relate to them. And I think that's the beginning of success in almost any position. Yeah, there's no doubt about it. I mean, I'll take one point from that being unafraid. I think that's probably the most, the biggest thing that people have to overcome uh, I have to overcome it on a regular basis. I'm sure you have to overcome it on a regular basis. Every time you go to pick up the phone uh, and you're gonna ask for something, something always creeps in your head, like, should you be doing this? Should I be doing that? And I, people have to realize that that's always gonna happen. That's right. not gonna go away. It's human to feel like that. You know, oh, it's yeah. human to feel like, what's this person gonna think about me? Then you gotta take a, a second, breathe, and put that aside and, and go and do it. And I think that's where people, uh, especially from a long run standpoint, uh, fail and you know succeed. Is that when they succeed too quick, they think it just uh, you know they. In a lot of cases, that there was some skill involved, but you may have had you know fell into the right place. When you succeed on a long run basis, um, it's because you continue have dealt with those failures when you have dry spells, but you also uh, continue to plug away and, and, and nail it. Um, the scouts, and I find it, I, I, you had uh, a really interesting, I read, and I, I always skim your articles. Your articles are great, but I always skim through. I look for the stuff that I want to grab on. Yeah. Uh, I happened to read this whole entire article, which was one of your recent ones. It may have been your most recent one, which is how scouts felt about agents. Mm -hmm. And I found it to be, now it was, I guess I probably knew this, but, um, but actually seeing it, what I thought was really, really interesting. And then it made me think like, cause there's two sides of it. Um, so many agents absolutely have no idea how to build a proper relationship. 
Um, and I'm sure I'm guilty of some of those things from time to time. Um, but it, but some of those things were so extreme and what some guys do that they, they obviously have no idea. Mm -hmm. And then I also feel like scouts are trying to avoid the relationship. So, but both groups, uh, it, it, it really kind of like they want to do it without them. And, you know, theoretically, I guess you could um, you could do without them. And the agent could probably, depending on how good his player is, do without the scout. But if everybody's going to be successful moving in the direction, I'm sure most scouts are looking to move up at some point. And most agents are looking to get better clients and better and better clients. Um, building those relationships become important. How do you, as the go-between, explain to uh, each party in, in the right way that, hey, you kind of want to try to figure out how you can work with each other. Mm -hmm. Boy, Dad, you're, you're, not, you're not giving me any easy ones today. Right? <laughs> uh, <laughs> you know, I think agents, boy, I've had this conversation so many times with agents that uh, they talk about, hey, how do I meet scouts? And, uh, and then <laughs> scouts kind of say, how do I avoid agents, you know? Um, so how do you bring them together? I think if you're an agent, the best you can do is understand that they have a job to do and not bombard them with minutia. I mean, so many, so many. I know when I used to run all-star games, I would get bombarded by a, a guy would just copy and paste the draft scout page of some player that he signed and just send it to me. Like, I can't Google that, you know? Um, some of these guys send scouts literally every day a list of the players they have as their clients, as if the guys, I mean, the teams don't really care about that. If they, if they, there's a player they want, they will come and find you. So I think that you don't bombard them with minutia. These days with email, it's so easy and economical to send email that everyone thinks, well, when in doubt, I send an email. That's only gonna piss people off half the time. Um, if you're sending them stuff that they already have or don't need, and especially if you're dishonest. I mean, don't come and say your kid ran a 4-4 if you ran a 4-7. I mean, that it's going to kill your credibility, and there's always a next year. So I think as an agent, that's what you have to remember. Gosh, as a scout, I think the one thing I would say to scouts is these agents are in a difficult position, and they don't have a lot of leverage. Um, you know, deleting an email is not a bad thing. Um, I guess do the best thing, best you can to be patient with them while they're learning. Uh, I, I tell you, I got... It's really funny that the article that you're referring to, which is last Friday's blog post, and then it was continued in our Friday wrap, the newsletter that comes out every Friday that kind of caps what happened in the league every week, um, got an incredible response. And it, But it was interesting that a lot of scouts said, listen, I understand these guys are new and they're young, and sometimes they're gonna need questions answered and all those kind of things. I just wish they would be a little more respectful of my time when I'm at a pro day. When you're at a pro day and you're there to get numbers and get heights and weights and 40 times, when they're done running, you can't say, hey, could I get that time again? They're done running. It's over. So when an agent's trying to be a little too pushy and he's trying to get in the way and he's standing in front of your, you know, your, your sight line or whatever, you're not going to win any points with that scout. And that's what you've got to recognize. So I guess at the end of the day, it's common courtesy. A lot of people don't have that as in their gene structure. And a lot of people just, they do, but they haven't learned what's important and what isn't. And I think that only comes over time. But in, at the end of the day, you've got to be, your default mechanism has got to be courtesy and respect and honoring other people and then hoping that that bears fruit. And I think it has for me. I think it has for you. Um, it goes back to that patience thing, Dave. I, I think it's, it's such an interesting learning curve. And, and I, I think what you say, everything is so true. I can tell you, obviously now scouts will have a different side where they're getting pulled from the GM and the coaches to follow obviously what they want. And then I think what's interesting is that the agents get pulled really a lot of times from the player slash family. Who did you talk to? And the unfortunate thing of it is that the miseducation for them on their side as to what's really valued is, is um, you know, I, I could tell you this every single time and uh, I have a good relationship with a lot of guys and it developed it in a short time. Um, and we've, I've learned from, you know, when I'm in a pro day, basically stay in the background. I, I can identify who's kind of interested in my guy by what's going on throughout the pro day process. 
and then find out if he's really interested in him or not. And you, sometimes he is, and sometimes he isn't. You know. Um, and, and then when he when he isn't, and he's in a hurry, and he doesn't really want to talk to you if he doesn't know you per se, or if he does know you, you know things really even quicker because um, the guy he sees your name. No, oh, 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 you're, you're so. Yeah, and and then he kind of tells you that you know the skinny, which I love when a guy tells me the skinny on it. It, it really it really helps me focus um, not just the teams I'm going to focus on, but uh, how I'm going to approach things with my player. You know, and mm-hmm. uh, you know this year I had that big the he, well he's now a lineman with the with the New Orleans Saints, and um, we had a great strategy between me and him because he wanted to be you know he wanted to go in as a tight end. I got the feedback from from scouts that a lot of guys did see him possibly as a tackle, and we knew our kind of game plan all the way through that. Okay, we'll see what tight end brings us, but if if it doesn't bring us exactly what we want, then we're gonna move real quick if if a, t- a tackle opportunity comes, which Absolutely. it kind of it did. It fell into place, which was great. Mm-hmm. Uh, uh, it doesn't always work out that way, but. You know, scouts did help with that, you know, providing that information. Mm-hmm. I really got to know, like, hey, do you really see him as a tight end? Do you really see him as a tackle? Like, are you willing to, you know, uh, to work with him or not? And I, I think that's real important. But I think what's what's really interesting, and I, I hope one day you solve this, because I don't know if anybody else other than you could solve this. The, the education of helping a player understand what actually is going to happen. So the agent and the scouts can do their job properly, right? Because what happens is all of a sudden, um, and it doesn't happen as much with top tier players, I think, because the top tier players really, really at the high end, they kind of understand where they fall. So they know, you know, if they're potentially a top 15 pick, they could probably go as high as 10 fall as low as the mid-second round. They kind of have an idea. Yeah, they're not going to be happy if that happens, but they kind of know their range. It's the guys who don't know their range that are late round free agent types who probably will get an opportunity, but are are almost paranoid about the fact that if something could go wrong, um, helping them to understand that, you know, if you choose a guy, you want to have great communication. That's the most important thing. But you also want to try to let him do what he does because in the end, they end up hurting themselves. I can't tell you how many guys, and I'm sure agents tell you this all the time, I am inundated with emails of guys who sometimes are fairly big name guys that are now like cut from CFL or that are looking for guys. And I, I I tell guys this all the time, if you're sending me an email and I look it up and you're not actually with a team and you've been cut, the NFL is a little different, but if you got cut from like CFL or you're not in the league currently, it's like a needle in a haystack to get you back in. And it's not your agent. I try to tell them, I actually try to tell them, it's not your agent's fault that you currently have representing you. It's kind of the evolution of your career and you may be at the end of your career, or you may not have, you may be someone who's just not going to have that opportunity. Mm-hmm. And to really explore that before you go and reach out to everybody, because every agent who opens that email is thinking, any smart agent is thinking the same thing that I am is like, is this guy really any good? You know, or, or does this guy have anything left in his career? And, um, uh, you know, that part I, I hope gets figured out because I think it'll help the players, you know, as a former football player myself, right? And I went through the process and didn't end up like, you know, I got offers to go to the CFL, but didn't, you know, I, I knew I was going to be successful in business. So I chose that route. I didn't think financially it was worthwhile for me to get my head beat in for that. Um, but I did want to go to the NFL, didn't end up going into to uh, get picked up to go into camp. And had no idea why. Now I'm a. Ra- I always found myself to be a rational person. I had backup plans, so I wasn't really worried about it. But a lot of the players don't think that way, and helping them to understand the the process and what can happen, even numbers wise. Like when I tell players this, and they start to understand this. I say, how many draft picks are there? You know, so it's what two fifty six, I think, right? Or so two hundred fifty six picks. Yeah, yeah, well, it could be compensatory or whatever, right? Yeah. So somewhere around there. And uh, um, that's 
256 players that are getting into the NFL. And then you got, you know, another 100 to 200 guys. So the same number as under after free agents. Right. Right. So that's 500 some odd players in the whole entire United States. Um, Division one programs alone, there's 120 some odd, maybe 130 now, Division one programs. Each one of those have a class of probably 15 seniors. Do the math mm -hmm. on that, right? So now you start to realize, now you got all the other classmen that come in them. Do the math on that. So now you're fighting for very few spots. So you have to understand that if you get in, you are among the chosen few. And, and, you just, yeah. and you're just talking about FBS, Dave. Yeah, we're it's talking about FBS. Yeah. Right. So we're not talking, right, FCS, which is another 100 programs, another 15 seniors, and, and then you got division – you know, there's so many of those Division II players, Division Three, and NAI players that have now gotten some opportunities um, because they either got overlooked coming out of high school because of, you know, and I'm in the recruiting process standpoint. Everything's so front loaded in Division One recruiting that, and, and and if they make a mistake, it's really not a big deal. I, parents hate when I say that. Like, uh, it's not a big deal. There's another group of kids coming in next year. And they're almost better off if they make a mistake that that kid goes on somewhere else. So parents have a hard time understanding what that exactly means. But I'm saying, you know, you go FBS, like they might make mistakes and it's not the end of the world. If Alabama, even Alabama mistakes on a player, more than likely spring ball rolls around, that kid's going to transfer out somewhere and they're going to replace him with a new player that comes in the next year. So, um, for them to understand that they, they are, you know, the chosen few and that they have an opportunity it is would be so helpful for them to go and go through the process and end their football career, and this is my biggest point, with a positive taste in their mouth. Because there's so many guys that should take that end of the career. They learn so much. Go coach. Go uh, become a phys ed teacher and go, you know, um, be a scout, maybe be an agent, maybe be a trainer, and be able to take advantage of that opportunity that they they don't do that because they get upset with the process. Yeah, yeah. What are your thoughts well, on that? Well, I think any business that involves passion, you know, I, I don't, I've never sold insurance. I've never uh, been a car, sale, uh, car salesman. I've never done the other jobs. Um, I have been a journalist. Um, when I was a journalist, I wasn't real passionate about it. Um, I think there are a lot of jobs you can be successful at, but you're not necessarily excited on Sunday night when you got to wake up and do it five more days and wake up at six in the morning to do it. Football's different, man. Um, it goes back to that showbiz aspect of things, and there is a passion. And it is, I mean, I know, Dave, that when you turn down those CFL offers, you are ready to see what was next, but there's still a part of you right. that had a hard time walking away. All right. um, for so many kids that don't take their education seriously, it's a really different proposition because they get that gnawing feeling of knowing it's over for them, but they don't have a next chapter readily available. And so there's that as so there's the aspect of moving from an exciting phase of your life that has endless promises and poten and potentially offer status and money and all these things, having to close that door. But then also the aspect of having to open a door to uncertainty that you don't know what's behind. I mean, um, you know, the success is no guarantee off the field for a lot of these athletes. And so I think it's a two tiered thing when they and that's why they pursue it so passionately. That's why you have arena football league players. And that's why you have indoor football league players. That's why you have semi pro players. That's why you have all these guys that just can't give up the dream because number one, they're giving up they're grieving over losing a life that they have always wanted all their lives and everyone's always told them they should do. And meanwhile, they don't know what is left if they don't do that. So I guess those are the two sides of why it is so hard and why you're always, always, always going to get a thousand emails from people saying, Hey Dave, why don't you come sign me? I'm the next Kurt Warner. You know, I think you put that unbelievably well. I really do. I mean, I think uh, any, any athlete that, listens to that can 100% relate to what you said that you're you're a hundred percent correct and, and that the love for the sport is something that's unique it, it's also why 
you know, as, as a guy who coaches high school football, I'm always so sad and where they're always trying to push people away from football because of the, yeah. so many things that football has done. And, um, you know, there's there, there are challenges in football uh, uh, from some of the things medically, but it's a shame to throw out the baby with the bathwater on it. It's it's and I, and I see so many places trying to do that and not understanding uh, what it really does for so many of these these kids, you know, and, and, and young men. Um, I don't think that I have any more questions because I think you answered that so well at the end. Um, tell people where they can go and find your website, how they can reach out to you on Twitter, any of that kind of stuff. Well, we have uh, three, I guess, kind of outreach uh, points. The, the, the free ones involve our Twitter account, which you mentioned. We're at Inside the League, very simple to remember. Uh, right this time of year, we're breaking a lot of information on scouting, hiring, and firing, and movement. There isn't anyone who really focuses on that aspect of the game. We think it's an important one. And so we've tried to own that area. And uh, we've been fortunate to uh, be followed by a lot of people in the game for that reason, some people in the media for that reason. Um, knowing, again, it's the relationships and knowing where people came from and why they're getting hired and who's getting hired and all those kind of things. And that's something you can follow just following our Twitter account. We also have a blog that succeed in football, very simply, that is our credo. Uh, you alluded to uh, one post on there, that's free as well, it's a simple WordPress doc, uh, site. If you are looking for GWiz graphics, you're gonna be sorely disappointed when you go to our blog uh, site. Um, so it's nothing real fancy, but we are trying to talk about things that are integral to the game. We've been fortunate to develop a pretty serious following, again, among people that are deeply inside the game, agents, trainers, scouts uh, really read a lot of that we also have i guess there's a fourth tier we have something called our friday wrap which comes out every friday and very often we'll start something on our post on friday on succeeding football we'll continue it in our as our lead into the friday wrap and we again that goes out to about around five thousand people in the industry and we've been fortunate again to develop a nice following with that i encourage people to register for the friday wrap it's I think, I hope insightful. Um, if you're interested in the business and you're interested in what's going on in the game behind the game, which I am, I know you are, Dave, I think it's something valuable. And you can go to our, uh, all. it's all over our blog post, the link to sign up for that. You can also find it on our Twitter. And then ultimately, I guess, uh, the home site, insidetheleague.com is where it all started. If you go to the home site, you're going to be disappointed. Most of the links there are password protected. It's kind of how we make our money. We've always been uh, a, a subscriber driven site rather than a content uh, site where we're trying to aggregate as much information we can and then hope we get ad clicks. Uh, that's just not been our, our game. Um, if anyone is interested in learning more about Inside the League and they'd like to come in and check it out, just reach out to me on Twitter. You can contact us through the website. I'll be happy to plug in and copy for a few days so you can get a good uh, taste of what we do. And if you're Someone who aspires to be a scout or even an agent and you're still in school, we have something called a Next, Next Wave subscription, which is a good bit cheaper. Um, it's kind of how we try to groom people. We have, it's been an outstanding off season for us because we have four people right now with three teams that have been hired or promoted as in, in the scouting departments of teams that are former uh, Next Wave subscribers. So we feel like we're getting into the grassroots of it and we're hopefully making a difference. We've gotten a lot of positive feedback from our work with people in that regard and we hope to continue to expand that I mean when we say we are interested in helping people succeed in football we really mean that and we don't just mean on the field there are so many places where you can find a niche it's what I did and um, if you study it long enough and research it long enough and you want it badly enough you can find something to you know, find an area that's underserved and we want you to do that we want everyone to succeed in football and that's what we try to do today Neil, thank you so much for being on. Thank you for taking the time. Uh, I'll let you go back to the Texas Football Clinic. I'm guessing it is, right? Uh, be... Yeah, Angelo Football Clinic. Yeah, Angelo here in San Football Angelo. Clinic. It's pretty exciting stuff. Nick Saban's going to be out there in about three hours. So uh, wow. I want to make sure I'm there for that. <laughs> Absolutely. Well, we'll sign off. This, this will be up real soon. And thanks so much for coming on, Neil. I appreciate you having me on, Dave. Have a great day, buddy. All right.